Hi there, we are back together again for uh, another look at the great ones. We're looking at key chapters of the Bible throughout the year 2020, and then trying to ask ourselves uh, three different questions as we read the text. First is, what has God said? In other words, what's the big idea? What is God trying to tell us? And we want to not read into it our opinion, but we want to really come to understand the context of Scripture. Secondly, it's what has God said to me? As a result of reading God's Word, what, is, what do I feel that the Spirit is saying into my life, uh, my habits, my beliefs, values, etc.? And then lastly, what will I say about this chapter to others as I get an opportunity? Surely within our family structure, we should be talking about our reading of these chapters, but also with friends, classmates, etc. Surely we can find something within each chapter that we can talk about with somebody and get them to think spiritual thoughts. So with that said um, done, we are going to look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, so if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. Acts 2 is a, one of the truly great chapters in the Bible. It deals with a number of different topics. We know it uh, most generally as the formation of the early church or the Christian church. But what I want to do is outline this chapter for you so this will help your study. Anytime you're looking at more than 10 verses of the Bible, you really uh, are going to have to prioritize. You can easily read a chapter but to really think about it, meditate on it, even do a little study on it, it becomes a little overwhelming. So I want to lay out for you uh, seven different sections of this chapter. Uh, as you read it, you can take note of uh, the topics that I've given you for an outline form, but you may just settle on one of these for your study. For example, Acts chapter 2, verse 1, is the what I would call the indication of a new beginning, the indication of a new beginning. It says here, and I'm reading from the NIV first, it says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Now reading a different version of this, it says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. So depending on the version of the Bible you have, it may have a different rendering, but you get the idea. It indicates that there's going to be something new that is happening or beginning. We know this from our previous reading, if you, if you had read that, Acts chapter 1, in which Jesus has told his disciples, go back to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit to come upon them. So the believers that had uh, been following Christ all head back to Jerusalem and they gather in one place, as it says. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. The second part of this chapter is in Acts chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. 2 through 4. And that's the presentation of the Holy Spirit. Uh, this promise of the Holy Spirit had been predicted in the Old Testament and Jesus several times talked about it in the New Testament, and here we see that it's happening. So the presentation, it's, it's God giving the Holy Spirit to uh, believers, and in the process of that, he forms what we know as the church today. So we have the indication of a new beginning, and we have the presentation of the Holy Spirit. This brings about a total change in the way the Holy Spirit functioned uh, in the lives of people. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come as God saw fit. It was uh, generally external, because we read in Scripture, it says the Spirit came upon somebody, and the Holy Spirit could leave people. This is totally um, changed now, because the Holy Spirit is given to all believers. It is a permanent residing within us, and there's a number of other uh, ch fundamental changes that we'll see. But it is a gift that uh, the Father had promised uh, through prophets in the Old Testament, which Jesus himself had made. Third section of this chapter is Acts chapter 2, verse 5 through 13. Chapter 2, 5 through 13. And this is the reaction of the crowd. There are thousands of people gathered here in Jerusalem, tens of thousands of people, because it's one of the major religious holidays. It's The Jews had a number of religious festivals. They had three major festivals, and this is the middle of the three of them. 
and one of the most joyous times. Uh, it's the day of Pentecost, and we'll talk about that here in a few moments. So the reaction of the crowd, that as the Holy Spirit comes upon people, uh, those that are standing around are awestruck. They're also confused. What is exactly happening? And that leads us then to the fourth section of this uh, chapter. It's verse 14 through 21. Acts 2, 14 through 21. And this is the explanation of Simon Peter. The, the crowd is unsure of what's going on. Some of them think that the uh, apostles and the others have been drinking, but it's early morning. They can only attribute uh, the hearing of foreign languages to the fact that these guys must be drinking and they're partying. What's going on? They really don't know. So Peter gets up. It says in verse 14 through 21, he gives a clear explanation about what they are observing and what has happened. So we have the indication of a new beginning in verse 1. We have the presentation of the Holy Spirit, verses 2 through 4. We have the, expl or the reaction of the crowd, verse 5 through 13. And here we have the explanation by Peter, verse 14 through 21. The next section of this chapter is in verse 22 through 36. 22 through 36. And this is what you could call the proclamation or the explanation or the declaration of the gospel. Uh, you could use any of those words. I, I've written in my notes the declaration of the gospel. Peter not only explains what has happened with the Holy Spirit, but he very clearly uh, presents the gospel to those people who are listening to him. Um, many people believe that this took place on the southern steps of the temple of Jerusalem, a huge uh, set of steps that thousands of people could have stood on and easily listened to Peter as he would have had the backdrop of the temple behind him. And as he spoke, his voice would have clearly been heard. But he really explains um, the gospel, what it means that Jesus came, his death, and his resurrection. Then we have the conversion of 3,000 people or 3,000 souls. This is verse 37 through 41, Acts 2, 37 through 41. Peter very clearly explains the gospel, and what we see is that at least 3,000 people came to faith. That is amazing. I've never seen anything like that in my life, and I know that you haven't. But it was really the kickstart, if you will, to the Christian church. And you have to remember, a lot of these people that are standing there at Pentecost, which is only 50 days after Jesus was crucified and came back to life, a lot of those people had probably been at that earlier feast, the Feast of Passover. They may have heard firsthand um, from eyewitnesses uh, what had happened to Jesus. A number of them probably had been there and had seen Jesus enter the city, had Je seen Jesus as he was um, teaching in the temple courts, had seen Jesus as he was crucified. So what we learn from chapter 2 here, in verse 37 through 41, a number of them are struck in their hearts. It's like their heart uh, seizes on them, and they realize, oh no, we have crucified the Messiah that we have been looking for. And they are told to repent, and they do. So we see 3,000 people come to faith. The last part of this chapter is Acts 2, verse 42 through 47 verse 42 through 47. This is called the formation of the church, the formation of the church. And we see the early church as it begins now. And we see some of its characteristics, and we see the way that New Testament Christians and Christians today should be reacting to their faith in Christ. There should be a sense of bonding together. Uh, the Bible says that they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine in prayers and fellowship and breaking of bread. Christians need to continue together. Church to, in this period of time was not just come on Sunday. The Bible says they continued meeting together in temple courts and house to house. Christianity is about community. Christianity is about sharing life, not tuning in once a week to our TV or radio or reading a book that somebody has written. It's about shared life. 
So what have we looked at here? Seven different uh, sections to this uh, great chapter. What I want to do is just look at that first section. It's one verse, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It's, and it says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, this one place where they're gathered is a definite, um, has a definite correlation to what was talked about earlier in Acts chapter 1 and verse 13, when early believers had been together, uh, they now come back to the same place. Oftentimes, Bible commentators will tie this also to the location of the upper room, where Jesus and his disciples met just, the, just before he was crucified. But they have gathered together. And here's what we can learn. And what I want to focus on is just the idea of Pentecost. It says, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, or when the day of Pentecost had came. Pentecost, the, the word itself means 50, or 50 of. Um, it is a major festival, one of the three great pilgrim feasts on the Jewish calendar. A pilgrim feast meant that um, Jewish males, and, and generally their families, would travel to Jerusalem. They had other religious feast days, but only on these three were they required to go. This uh, feast generally took place in our American calendars, we would say in the month of May, June, uh, because they didn't go from the 1st to the 31st, just the way the Jewish calendar was set up. Um, but this is when the festival took place. We would say it would be in late spring, possibly early summer. Uh, this Feast Pentecost means 50. It goes by other names, too, in Scripture. It's referred to as the Feast or the Festival of Weeks, or um, the what is sometimes referred to in Scripture as the Latter First Fruits. It has several different names that it goes by in Scripture. It takes place 50 days after Passover, the time in which Jesus was crucified. Uh, so 50 days after that, this had gone on for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. It was instituted uh, by God on, at Mount Sinai uh, to Moses. Um, this was a very joyous feast because it would be the very first fruits of the spring crops, generally the wheat harvest, in which the children of Israel would bring an offering. They would look at their uh, harvest. They would bring a portion of that to the temple offered to God. It was really a festival of thanksgiving. Uh, it was a time to really let the Lord know that we appreciated him. And it was, as you brought that first fruits, what you're saying is, God, we thank you for this, but we know that you're providing much, much more than this. This is just a token of what yet is to come. So that's what the uh, Feast of Pentecost meant. Uh, at Pentecost, the first fruits were offered. And this has a lot of significance to Christians today because this was the formation of the Christian church. Those 3,000 people that became believers on that day were like the, the uh, a sheave of wheat that was brought to the temple saying, thank you, God, for what you have done. And we know there is much, much more that is going to come. So there's a lot of symbolism that is used here. Uh, when we look at this festival of Pentecost, there's a lot of things in Scripture and in history that are associated with it. For example, uh, it is con uh, connected to God giving the Ten Commandments to Moses on Mount Sinai. In fact, in, according to the Jewish people, they would say that the festival of um, uh, Pentecost took place 50 days uh, the giving of the law took place 50 days after the children of Israel uh, experienced that first Passover and their deliverance out of Egypt. 50 days later, Mount Sinai, they received the law. When they received the law, that was the formation of the Jewish people as the people of God, the people of Israel. In the same way, uh, 50 days after Jesus was risen from the grave, had risen from the grave, God is beginning something brand new. He's beginning the church, the Holy Spirit. Just like the law came to the Jewish people, the Holy Spirit comes to, to those who had their faith in Christ. Whereas the Jewish people became, um, we would say that the people of God, the people of Israel, uh, 
at first with Moses, in this case, they become the early church. So there's a lot of ties here and a lot of symbolism. Um, when the Jewish people celebrate uh, the day of um, Pentecost, the Feast of Pentecost, they read several key passages of Scripture. And you can write these down if you want. The Book of Ruth is always read in families uh, throughout this period of time. Also, Deuteronomy chapter 26 is uh, read, and Psalm 67. In, uh, all of those are shared, read individually, in their families, and within congregations, Jewish congregations during this Feast of Pentecost. All of that relates to the first fruits. All of that relates to Thanksgiving. Uh, another thing that is associated, uh, the Jewish people, even to this day, because uh, this festival speaks about the harvest and speaks about the joyous nature of the harvest, they have a lot of honey and dairy-related foods throughout this entire festival. It's a time of sweetness, if you will. It's a time of enjoying the goodness of God and celebrating. So it's a very joyous time, and that comes from the idea that Israel is called the land of milk and honey, if you will. Another interesting Jewish tradition is this. They believe that on this day, when the Feast of Pentecost is held, that not only was the law given to Moses, but it is also the day that King David was born and the day that King David died. So it's intriguing how all of this Feast of Pentecost has many ties throughout the Old Testament and in Jewish tradition and history. So those are just a few things that will help you to understand Pentecost as you open up this chapter and begin to look at it. One further thought is this, and it's an intriguing one. The Jews had a festival back, way back in the book of Leviticus, chapters 23, 24, 25, called Jubilee. It took place every 50 years. And again, the idea of 50 could easily be tied into Pentecost, which means 50. And many scholars believe that this would have been the time frame in which the festival of Jubilee was held on, on that first Pentecost. Uh, Jubilee, if we can think of it this way, if you had to borrow money and mortgage your home or mortgage your property because maybe you're going through a famine or a hard time, somebody else now holds the lien to your property. And that you could go for 5, 10, 15 years, somebody else really owning your property, and you become a servant to them, even in some cases like a slave to them, working your own property to pay off the debt that had been incurred. God never wanted the children of Israel to, go, to be enslaved to one another or to anyone else. So every 50 years there was a, this festival, Jubilee, where all land, all debts were forgiven, all land was returned to the original uh, landholder or with their family. It was an interesting time. So God wanted his people to be free. And if this is the case here with Jubilee and Pentecost having a tie, the people had been enslaved to sin and they were set free at this day on Pentecost, the Jubilee, and they were given a new identity and they were restored to being the people that God wanted them to be. So that is a lot of the history, a lot of the tradition uh, that has been tied into the subject of Pentecost. It's the formation of the church. God baptizes, you'll see this as you read the text, he baptizes them with the Holy Spirit. Literally, he immerses them into the body of Christ at this point. It is a spiritual connection that they that is a uh, that takes place we see the church functioning we see the church not only um, having people added to it but we see the church prospering from this day forward so as you read acts chapter 2 i hope that you enjoy it i hope that you will um, really look at the feast of pentecost maybe do your own study learn some things there but as you look at this remember this is a this is 50 days after jesus has been crucified and risen from the grave. 50 days later, the church begins, and the church has continued ever since then up to this day. The church is Christ's body. The church is the place where Christians fellowship and worship together. The church is not a, so much a building, it is a gathering, but it's a place where God's people 
live out their new identity of people who are free, people who have been delivered, and people on mission. So as you read chapter two, I hope you enjoy it. I hope it speaks to your heart and look forward to answering any questions that you might have. All right, God bless you. Bye.